Evolutionists have a big problem. For their theory of random unguided forces to account for all life on Earth, it needs to account for life's emergence, too. The problem is, spontaneous generation was proven to be impossible by Louis Pasteur in 1864. In an effort to distance their exercise and futility from spontaneous generation, they redubbed it abiogenesis. Well, you can redub it all you want, but you're still trying to create life from non-life, which has already been disproven. And this is why all experiments, like the Miller-Urey experiment, failed to create life. As synthetic chemist Dr. James Tour notes, there has been no progress in origin of life research since. There are four classes of molecule needed for life. Nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids, and scientists are clueless on how to produce any of them. With no indication of any future success, they have been trying in vain to create new life in the lab. Unsurprisingly, every attempt has failed. So why are our tax dollars going to fund this exercise in futility? I had to investigate. The oldest writings we know of on the naturalistic origin of life come from pre-Socratic Greek philosophers such as Anaximander and Xenophanes as early as the 6th century BCE. In the 4th century BCE, Aristotle incorporated spontaneous generation into his natural theories on life, describing it, along with parthenogenesis and sexual reproduction, as one of the methods through which life comes forth. In the 5th century, St. Augustine assumed spontaneous generation in his two works, The City of God and The Literal Meaning of Genesis, citing biblical passages such as Genesis 1.20, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. This he saw as a decree of ongoing creation. In the 12th century, Archdeacon Gerald of Wales argued that because barnacle geese spring forth from goose barnacles, they were acceptable to eat during the observance of Lent as they would be fish, not birds, and were evidence for a virgin birth. The idea of spontaneous generation was simply accepted by both the religious and the scientific world. In 1646, Thomas Brown published Pseudoxia Epidemica, an attack on what he called false beliefs and vulgar errors, including spontaneous generation. It was quickly rebuffed by his contemporary Alexander Ross. To question this is to question reason, sense, and experience. If he doubts of this, let him go to Egypt, and there he will find the fields swarming with mice begot of the mud of Nihilus, to the great calamity of the inhabitants. It was friend Francesco Redi, who as early as 1668 challenged the notion that maggots form from rotting steak by placing meat in a variety of sealed, open, and screened containers. Maggots were later seen only on the exposed steak and the screen, but not on the steak behind the screen nor in the sealed container. Redi's work was repeated several times and built upon by others. The decline of spontaneous generation was all but done in 1859 when Louis Pasteur performed his experiment with boiled meat broth in swan-necked flasks. The bend in the neck of the flask prevented falling particles from reaching the broth while still allowing air. The flask remained free of growth until the flask was turned so that particles could fall down the bend, after which the broth became clouded. Spontaneous generation had effectively been rendered moot. Fun fact, the first use of the word biogenesis was by Henry Bastian in 1869, which he ironically defined as life arising from non-life. The following year, Thomas Henry Huxley redefined the term in his address, biogenesis and abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is a general term for any kind of life arising through natural means from non-living material. This was not a redubbing of spontaneous generation, as none of the models showing promise could ever be described as spontaneous. A better description would be gradual generation or incremental generation. In fact, the most popular model of abiogenesis among researchers such as Thomas Huxley, Alexander Oprin, and Jonathan Haldane was dubbed archibiosis. Instead of life developing in a single step, as spontaneous generation assumes, archibiosis held that life was composed of simpler structures that themselves were composed of simpler structures. With this assumption, Oprin and Haldane deduced that the chemical constituents to life could be synthesized from molecules common in Earth's early atmosphere, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water vapor. In 1953, under the tutelage of Harold Urey, Stanley Miller tested Oprin's hypothesis by circulating methane methane, ammonia, water, and hydrogen passed an electric discharge in an enclosed flask and a tubule system. Over the course of a week, the contraption had precipitated amino acids, the basic building blocks of the proteins that make up living structures, 11 of which were of the 20 from the most ancient common genes that
than all life shares. I covered the details of this experiment, its ramifications, and its singular influence on science in episode 10, the Miller-Urey experiment. The results of the experiment confirmed Oprin's and Haldane's predictions. This was not life, nor was it meant to be. It was amino acids, the building blocks of protein. Multiple other experiments showed that amino acids form readily through various other methods, including catalyzation via Montmorillonite clay. The discovery of amino acids in numerous meteorites like the Murchison meteorite indicated that amino acids were not as novel as previously thought. It was Sidney Fox and Kaoru Harada who took the next step in assembling a protein. In order to simulate the high temperatures and alternatively wet and dry conditions that the precursors to life would have to endure, the two submerged amino acids for three hours in a slightly acidic oil bath heated to 180 degrees under a layer of CO2. After cooling and sitting overnight, a gray precipitate was left behind. After being filtered, the precipitate was put in dialysis tubing and left in water for four days. When the inside of the tubes were observed, polypeptide chains that Fox called proteinoids were present. Their results were published in their paper, Thermocopolymerization of Amino Acids to a Product Resembling Protein, in the November 14th issue of Science. Their work suggested that further research could lead to answers to how anabolic reactions, enzymatic proteins, and nucleic acids were first formed and, in turn, how the earliest forms of life originated. Around 1965, Panayatis Katsuyanis at the University of Pittsburgh and Helmut Zanat at RWTH Aachen University in Germany both independently synthesized the first protein, insulin, through chemical means, but biologists noted that for longer proteinoid chains to be produced, additional chemical reactions needed to occur. This made even the most basic proteins incredibly resource and labor intensive. In 1994, Philip Dawson began publishing a series of papers chronicling his experiments at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California, resulting in the production of natural proteins. This led to a greater understanding of how proteins fold, but it still utilized the existing protein scaffolding of living organisms. In 2004, Dawson published again, showing that in six years, chemical methods of protein synthesis had overtaken native methods in efficiency for creating new and novel proteins. In 2011, a team led by Michael Fisher and Kara McKinley removed vital working proteins from a population of E. coli and replaced them with man-made synthetic proteins. The population immediately began using the new novel proteins to carry out life-supporting functions. Lipids are another molecule that serves multiple purposes in biology, from toxins to making up the bilipid layer in a cell membrane. By 1964, biologists were experimenting with lipid bilayers and restoring them. That year, Alec Bangham published a paper in the Journal of Molecular Biology detailing experiments showing that lipids will automatically align into bilayers after being hydrated. This allowed for experimentation with existing lipids, but synthesizing an actual lipid was elusive. In 1977, Toyoki Kunitaki and Yoshio Okahata synthesized the first bilipid layer incorporating van der Waals interaction. After decades of analyzing several lipid structures, in 1984, a team led by Tetsuo Shiba at the Osaka University Department of Chemistry successfully synthesized the E. coli lipid A through chemical means. The next year, a team at the Max Planck Institute published their results in the European Journal of Biochemistry after they studied the synthetic lipid A and compared it to the natural lipid A. Not only was it chemically identical, it was functionally identical to the natural lipid as an exotoxin. Work with lipids has exploded since then, even to the point of developing cell-like structures to accurately deliver medications. Carbohydrates serve various functions in biology, such as energy storage or even adding rigidity to plants. Synthesizing simple sugars is rather simple for chemists, but complex carbohydrates like disaccharides, polysaccharides, and oligosaccharides remained problematic until 1963 when Robert Bruce Merrifield presented his solid phase method for peptide synthesis. A simplified description of the process would be that the peptide chain is assembled on a porous support by using amino acid reactions to catalyze its structure. When the peptide is complete, it is removed from its support and then utilized. Although this is a slow process, it still yields useful peptides, and it didn't take a whole lot of imagination to modify this method to synthesize other molecules like proteins. In 1971, Conrad Schirsch and Jean Frechet presented the solid phase method for synthesis of complex carbohydrates. While this was useful for research, it was far too slow for any kind of massive manufacturing of carbohydrates. In February 2001, a team led by Peter Seeberger from the Max Planck Institute presented an automated version of the solid phase method. This cut the time in synthesis by a factor of 100. Seeberger has continued developing and improving methods of complex carbohydrate synthesis and has published several papers urging others to do likewise in the development of carbon-based drugs, vaccines, 
proteins, as well as novel drug delivery systems. Nucleotides are the building blocks of DNA. In chapter 10, we saw that nucleotides appear naturally through a variety of means. We also saw that specifically the nucleotides of RNA form naturally through the superheating of formamide, which also appears naturally. In 1951, John Bernal published a paper in Nature called The Physical Basis of Life, proposing that the surfaces of certain minerals like montmorillonite clay can catalyze the formation of various biological structures, including long chains of nucleotides like RNA. This proposition was subsequently confirmed by multiple researchers using montmorillonite clay to polymerize amino acids into long chains, vesicles, and as recently as 2003, Martin Hanchik and Jack Shostak discovered compartments forming when fatty acid chains began encapsulating montmorillonite grains and forming a cell-like structure. We will discuss more about this in the next episode, Abiogenesis Part 2. In the September 7, 2006 Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London, a team led by James Ferris noted the formation of long chains of RNA nucleotides on montmorillonite clay and suggested working on developing this method for the future manufacture of RNA and DNA chains. He improved upon this in 2011 in his paper to the Journal of Applied Clay Science. It should come as no surprise, however, that once again, the solid phase was introduced as a method of DNA synthesis in a 1981 paper to the Journal of the American Chemical Society by Mizio Mariucci and Marvin Carruthers. In the four decades since, this method has been accentuated and revised to the point to where synthesis of RNA and DNA chains is as simple as reprogramming a computer to select for the precise chain desired. Going further, in 2012, a team led by Hedrick Dietz and Frederick Simmel synthesized a bilipid layer from a synthetic DNA sequence. In 2017, a team led by Floyd Romsberg inserted synthetic genes into a culture of E. coli, resulting in a semi-synthetic organism that not only created new synthetic proteins, but also increased the overall storage capacity of the genome. In 2017, a team led by Gabriel Butterfield successfully synthesized an RNA chain encapsulated by its own synthetic protein. Previously, in 2005, Craig Venter and his team sought to determine the minimal gene needed to support life by editing out sequences from another population of E. coli. The goal being to add synthetic sequences of DNA for specific actions like creating new biofuels, removing pollutants, and countless medical procedures. This minimal species was named Mycoplasma laboratorium, or Cynthia. In 2010, Venter announced that he had completely synthesized a genome and replaced the DNA in a Mycoplasma bacterium, resulting in what was dubbed the very first synthetic life. To identify the species and any potential descendants as synthetic, this genome also contains non-protein coding information, including a code table for the entire English alphabet, the names of the 46 contributing scientists, three quotations, and a secret email address for the cell. In 2019, a team led by Jason Chin not only inserted a completely synthetic genome into another population of E. coli, but synthesized the genome with six nucleotides instead of four. While there's plenty we don't know about life, its chemistry, its functions, and its structures, the biggest difficulty surrounding life is in translation. You can create all the proteins you want, all the lipids you want, and all the carbohydrates you want. You can even have self-replicating molecules like RNA and DNA all you want. Until you have a method of translating your self-replicating sequence of nucleotides into proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates, you simply don't have life as we know it. Ribosomes were first discovered in 1955 by Romanian-American cell biologist George Emil Pallad using an electron microscope. Performing the function of translation, they are present in every single form of life we have ever examined. If DNA were to be the lines of code in a program, the ribosome would be the logic-gated circuit that translates into the structures making up a living body. In 1971, Alexander Rich experimented with different polymers in the ribosome of a specimen of E. coli. After treating a transfer RDNA with nitrous acid and then feeding it into the ribosome, it began translating the modified transfer RNA into polyester. This shows that it doesn't have to be proteins, lipids, or carbohydrates that are catalyzed and it doesn't have to be RNA or DNA that is translated. A ribosome simply copies and translates whatever it can into whatever it can. The very center of the structure is a segment of RNA we call phase one, which by itself is capable of simple catalysis. Building upon this is phase two, which establishes an exit port for the molecule. 
Phase 3 extends that tunnel, allowing for more complex molecular chains. Phase 4 builds upon that. Phase 5 allows for the translocation of the product, making long chains easier. With Phase 6, the tunnel is extended longer and the ribosome can create a complete protein. This is the common core of every single ribosome in every single organism alive today from bacteria to you, and it is coded for by the same genes in every living being. The surprise for biologists, however, was the correlation we see in the shape of ribosomes to the phylogenic and genetic family trees that were developed from the time of Linnaeus. Building off of the core is phase 7, which is common to all eukaryotes or organisms whose cell contain a nucleus. This delivered a surprise in 1977 when Carl Woese observed a rudimentary phase 7 in selected prokaryotes, unicellulars without a nucleus in their cells. It turned out that this version of a phase 7 was common in many prokaryotes. This observation led to the reclassifying of prokaryotes to two kingdoms, separating archaea from the previously established bacteria. Building from this, phase 8 only appears in some animals in the form of long strands of double helical RNA called extension segments, which correlate to the phylogenic tree. All of these modifications, yet the core remains unchanged and even gives us a glimpse into what processes were occurring before life emerged. In 2013, a team led by David Lay from the universities of Oxford and Manchester constructed a molecular machine that would pick up amino acids it encountered and construct peptides or other long-chain polymers. In 2015, a team led by Cedric Orell at the University of Lyon in France reconstructed a ribosome and then replaced that ribosome in yet another population of E. E. coli. The new ribosome began producing proteins and the population proliferated. Creating the basic building blocks of life as we currently know them is not a fantasy, it's reality. It also isn't the same as creating life. One, we don't actually know which molecules actually made up the first life. And two, we really don't have a solid definition for what life actually is. I will be discussing both in the next episode. Contrary to what Dr. Tour claims, however, there have been immense advances in origin of life studies since the Miller-Urey experiment and yes, we can create all four classes of molecule that he claims we can't. And yes, we can make them function similarly or even better than their natural counterparts. They are another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.